Hello, I'm State Representative Henry Yanez. Welcome to The State of Your State, my public affairs show that brings the people of Macomb County news from our state capital. Michigan's state motto is, if you seek a pleasant peninsula, look about you. We are fortunate to live in a state with such natural beauty. Throughout the upper and lower peninsulas, our great lakes, rivers, streams, and forests offer great recreational opportunities to Michiganders of all ages. Our state has a great history and tradition of hunters and fishermen who come from all around the country to enjoy our state, which is one of the many reasons why we must conserve our environment for generations to come and enjoy. Here with me to talk about uh, how we uh, protect and manage our state's natural resources is Conservation Officer Captain Tim Robson from the Department of Natural Resources. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, Tim, uh, I do this with every show. Uh, my very first question is, uh, tell us a little bit about your department. Tell us about the DNR, how many people work there, who's the director, and, and uh, give us a little background. Sure. Yeah, the Department of Natural Resources uh, employs about 1,400 full-time employees right now. In the summertime, that goes up around 16 or 1,700 because we have lots of seasonal employees. Uh, the director is Keith Cray, former director of Department of Ag. He's been our director now for a few years. He's doing a real good job. Um, and uh, we're here to protect the resources for current and future generations. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, and and uh, you, you mentioned that you do have some seasonal employees. Uh, what, what kind of jobs do the seasonal employees do? Most of the seasonal employees work with uh, our parks division. Most of our parks are closed in the winter, and in the summer they hire seasonal employees or state worker fours, they typically call them. And, and uh, a lot of our park rangers are in that category, okay. seasonal. Oh, great. So, um, so tell us a little bit about your job, specifically as a conservation officer. Uh, are, are you a commissioned police officer? And uh, describe, uh, describe what you do. What's, what's, your, what's your daily day like? Well, I'll, I'll try to describe a con regular conservation officer's day. It's a little more exciting than my day is now. I'm an administrator. But uh, a conservation officers are commissioned police officers, peace officers in the state of Michigan, uh, full-fledged uh, law enforcement officers. We can enforce all the laws of the state of Michigan, but we, inf we uh, um, focus on natural resource-related laws. We don't focus on the drunk drivers and things like that. But if they come across our path, we deal with them. Um, typical day, it depends on if complaints are called in. Sometimes people call in complaints to our report all poaching line. Um, they have projects they're working on, school, schools they have to go do talks at. But typically, it's they hop in their truck or on their RV or snowmobile and go out and work among the uh, recreationists of, of Michigan and, and, and make sure that everybody's being safe and following all the rules and laws. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, um, hunting season is going to be starting here pretty soon. And um, Tell me a little bit about um, people who are, uh, you know, you want to fish or you want to hunt. Uh, how old do you have to be and what's involved with getting a, a hunting license? Okay, it's several facets to that question. Uh, right now there is no age in Michigan. You can, you can hunt and fish at any age, but depending on what age you are, uh, there are restrictions on what you can hunt, what type of licenses you need, uh, such as... Uh, Youth that are nine or younger can get the mentoring hunting license program, which has several licenses involved. They have to be with a mentor, and it's very uh, hands-on and controlling because they're, they're so young and they haven't been through hunter safety. And then uh, once you're 10, you have to be through hunter safety, and then you can hunt uh, uh, most everything else. It might depend on if you're on public or private property what you can hunt. Uh, there are things that are open year-round. And then there are things that, uh, such year-round, like woodchuck, possum, ground squirrel, that kind of thing. Other things have seasons. Um, Hunting licenses, fishing licenses are all available at any, any retail uh, license agent. Most uh, Myers, Kmart, you know, that kind of store sell hunting and fishing licenses now. Um, fishing license in Michigan is required once you hit the age of 17. You still have to follow all the other laws related to fishing, but you don't need a license until you're 17 years old. And, and uh, are there any special days, either hunting or fishing, for youths or seniors or uh, uh, people with special needs? Yes, there are. There are. Uh, First of all, there's uh, free fishing weekends, two of those, one in the w winter and one in the summer that anybody can participate in. And then there's several uh, uh, special hunts for uh, youth and uh, disabled veterans and disabled hunters in the, in the fall, one in October and one in September. And, and all those are, are outlined in detail in our digest, which are free you know, to anyone. And I brought several here for you to leave with your office. Okay. Um, but they explain, you know, what kind of license you need, what kind. And, and typically they offer more opportunities on what they can do with that license, too. Oh, okay. And uh, so tell us a little bit about the hunting seasons. Uh, when will hunting season begin, 
and what will be uh, the, the first hunt of the year? Oh, okay. I, I guess I jumped ahead a little bit. Uh, there are things that are open right now. Like I said, year-round there's hunting opportunities in Michigan, uh, but fall is typically the big uh, push, September 15th. Uh, is a big small game opener, and that's when your squirrel and your rabbit and such things open. We have fall turkey. Obviously, deer season is the big one in Michigan. Uh, bow season starts October 1st, uh, runs through uh, January 1st, and then there's firearm deer season in there, which is the November 15th through the 30th season. We have muzzle loader seasons in there in December, and there are different dates depending on where you are in the state. Um, so if somebody wants to hunt any time of year, there's something open they can hunt. Yeah, and as far as fishing goes, we have ice fishing during the winter time, and and uh, in the spring. Uh, fishing in the lakes and streams. Um, fly fishing is that April 1st, I believe? Uh, the trout season? The trout season. Uh, yeah, yes. it's the end of April. End of April. Yep. Um, so, yeah, there's, fishing is open all year, too. And again, uh, there's fish you can fish for all year, and there's fish that you can't. And you have to make sure you know what you're going for sure. and, and what you're keeping in that, that season. Ice fishing, uh, yeah, there's lots of things you can catch through the ice. Uh, trout season is, is, is a big opener, especially in the northern part of the state. And that's the end of April, the last weekend in April. Sure. And if you want to uh, fish for trout or salmon, uh, you'd need something other than just your basic fishing license, is that correct? It used to be that way. It changed just last year with our license package. Now we just have the one license, so a person is good for, for anything. Yeah, and hunting and fishing, right? Well, hunting licenses are definitely, you need your base license, which is your small, old small sure. game license, and then you, te you add on to that with your deer licenses and your turkey license and your special licenses. But fishing now is, is unless you're going for sturgeon or something where you need a, a tag for, it's just one license and you're good for any, everything, and it made it a lot simpler. Okay, so one, fish, one license yep. for, for everything. Yep. Yep. That's, that's great. Uh, it does make it a lot simpler. It does. Because uh, I've been fishing a couple times with... Uh, uh, for salmon, and uh, once or twice, I realized I had to go buy a stamp before I got on the boat. So, um, so tell us a little bit about uh, um, th there's this uh, problem with the deer called chronic wasting. Um, can you tell us a little bit um, about uh, what's going on? I understand right here in the Lansing area, Meridian Township, they actually found three deer with this this problem. So, what should hunters look for um, if they suspect uh, uh, they uh, uh, come in contact with a deer with this? disease. Okay. Yeah, chronic wasting disease is a, is, a, is a terrible disease for the deer. It's, it's fatal. They can carry it for quite a while before symptoms appear. But if a hunter, hunter uh, either shoots a deer or, or even if they just see a deer and want to report it, that uh, looks emaciated, ribs sticking out, head hung low, uh, ears laying back, not acting normal, um, sometimes foaming at the mouth, they can report that by calling our report off poaching number, which is 1-800-292-7800. Uh, they can contact a wildlife biologist at a local office. If they end up with a deer that they think, or even if they have a deer and they just want to make sure that it doesn't have chronic wasting disease, they can take it to any of our check stations and submit the head, and they'll get the results back on uh, whether it had chronic wasting disease or not. And uh, that way and then they can know they're safe to eat that deer if they want to, or we, we find out if it really had the uh, chronic wasting disease. Three deer have been uh, found so far in the uh, Meridian Township area down here in Lansing. Uh, we don't know exactly how they got here or why, why it's here, but we're, we're investigating that obviously. And keep, we're doing a lot of uh, survey work right now. Okay, and uh, I know you're not a veterinarian, but do you know what causes the wasting disease? It's a, uh, a prion or prion, however you pronounce that, that uh, uh, we, we don't know how long it lives. We think it probably lives forever. It can get in the soil, it can uproot into plants. Um, they can transplant it, plant, or you know, transfer it deer to deer, uh, food piles, bait piles. Um, a deer that has it can die, uh, compost into the ground, and plants can grow up over that, and then the, and the deer can ingest that. Um, so it, you, you can't kill it any way we know of. So it's it's yeah, it's that's about all I know. Is it? It's not good, and it's around for a while. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for thanks for you know following up on the info on that. Um, so we want to make sure that our our. Um, hunting trip and our fishing trip is, is enjoyable. So can you give us a tip on the five, what you would consider the most important things that we should know uh, to have a uh, safe and enjoyable experience while we're out hunting? Sure, um, foremost, um, I like to tell people, leave a plan with somebody. You know, tell somebody that you, that's responsible where you're going, what you're gonna be doing, uh, what time you plan on being back, and you know what to do if you're not back in time. So that way, if something happens to you out there, somebody knows where and what you're doing. Um, secondly, I like to tell people don't uh, uh, drink alcohol or, or use illegal drugs or mind-altering drugs, uh, anything that's gonna alter your perception. Um, wear hunter's orange. You know, I tell people, even if you don't have to for the season that you're in, I, I recommend everybody wear it because you're a lot more visible. Um, 
always be sure of your target. That's what a lot of hunting accidents are. People aren't sure what they're shooting at or they're taking pop shots. Always be sure of what you're shooting at and, and try to follow all the rules and regulations there are to stay out of trouble. And, and one of the I really like to stress is to uh, make sure that you're on property you're supposed to be on. Recreational trespass is a big issue and a lot of confrontations happen when people end up hunting in somebody else's property and they're not supposed to be there. Great. Uh, so um, we're going to take a brief break. Uh, thank you so much for the information that you've given us so far, but we're going to uh, come right back. We're going to be back here shortly with uh, Conservation Officer Captain Tim Robson shortly after this uh, small brief break. They told me a bottle couldn't dream. That I would never become a superhero. But I learned how to fly. Just to come back in a new disguise and be the hero that I've always wanted to be. A single ember from a wildfire can travel over a mile. That ember can ignite and destroy your home or community. You can't control where that ember will land. Only what happens before it does. Visit fireadapted.org to learn how you can help protect your community from wildfires. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. Thank you for joining us for the second half of the State of Your State. My guest today is Department of Natural Resources Conservation Officer, Captain Tim Robson. So, so Tim, we talked a little bit uh, earlier about um, uh, safety when it comes to hunting, but uh, I love to fish. And um, I, I have to tell you, I, I've been ice fishing one time, and that one time I went ice fishing on Lake St. Clair, I saw somebody fall through the ice. And uh, that was my last <laughs> ice fishing trip. So can you give us uh, some tips, not only safety for ice fishing, if you can tell us a little bit about that and, and, the, and the, um, the ice fishing shanties that go on uh, the ice, but also safety in regards to uh, boating uh, tips as well. Sure, sure. Uh, ice fishing, yeah, we've got a lot of questions. People call our offices and want to know, you know, when, when is the ice safe? And, and we tell people uh, there never is any safe ice. And obviously, from your experience, you can see that. Um, you can go out on a lake or a river or any, you know, ice many, many times fishing throughout your, your life and it's always thick and it's always seems safe. And there's one time where the currents change or the air temperature changes, something changes and that ice isn't safe and somebody goes through. It happened up by my cabin in the UP last year, a guy that's lived on the lake for his life, his parents' life and his grandparents' life, uh, went out on a spot they always go to and he fell through and never before as he did that. So there really never is any safe ice. Um, Check the weather, see where other people are. Um, we recommend people take a spud, you know, and kind of spud their way out. And if the spud goes through, then find a different way. Don't walk in single file lines, you know, and, and, if, and if you do and somebody falls through, don't keep following them. Um, if you do go through the ice, uh, people tend to try to get out and try to stand up right away or crawl and you'll go back through. So lay flat, roll away from the hole, then you're dispersing your weight across a greater surface area and your chances of survival are a lot better. I also recommend to people to uh, wear a life jacket all the time, you know, whether they're on the water in the summer or on the ice in the winter. Um, this day and age, they have inflatables that nobody even knows you have on. They make coats that are uh, life jackets. And so if you go through, you're going to float. Because um, what happens is a lot of times is you get exhausted and hypothermic and you can't hang on and, and you're going to sink. And um, you, the, the life jacket will keep you up. Also, uh, I like to tell people to carry uh, ice picks. And I don't know, when people say that, they think that I'm talking about the ice pick you use to break up ice. No, they're like little handles that when you put them down, I, like little nails come out of the bottom or, uh, uh, or uh, even screwdrivers would work. And that way, if you do go through and the ice is real slippery and, and it's glare ice, you can kind of crawl your way out. Yeah, I know, um, I can tell you as a, as a firefighter, some of our training was uh, doing ice rescues and oh. we used ice picks. And, 
And uh, even as a firefighter, we used to have to do uh, dive in the water with our full bunker gear on. And I can tell you, even with all that equipment on, you can float if you do it right. So you right. know, people people who do go out in the water need to be aware of of uh, what to do in case of emergency. So uh, that's those are great tips, and thank you. You know, we talk uh, we've been talking a little bit about just regular fishing, um, of fly fishing, you know, rod and reel, spinner bait, that kind of stuff. But there are some non traditional ways to fish. Can you kind of cover? what some uh, people do in, uh, for fishing in the non-traditional way. Sure, and a lot of those have gotten really big lately too. And there's the old, uh, old style spearing, ice, spearing through the ice for uh, uh, pike and, and muskie. And uh, now in Michigan, there's several opportunities to spear for sturgeon in the state. Uh, Black Lake up uh, northern lower peninsula has a sturgeon spearing season. Uh, also, people are getting into underwater spearing, where it's uh, like the old spear gun type spearing, where you have to be submerged, and there's certain species you can take that way now, some of them year round, but you have to be submerged in the water, and it's a rubber propelled or spring propelled spear. Also, uh, uh, bow fishing has gotten uh, tremendously huge, a lot, you know, the uh, advancement in bow, bow technology, and, and a lot of people uh, get into bow fishing. A lot of big tournaments now across the state for bow fishing. Typically, they're carp or you know sucker kind of fish, but there are a lot of opportunities if you don't like the old line and line and reel method. Yeah, wow, well, that's uh, that's uh, quite a diversity of uh, opportunity for people who want to go outside and enjoy our our, uh, our great lakes and uh, streams. Um, Let's go back a little bit about the safety. You know, my, my apologies being a, a firefighter and paramedic. I'm, I'm always focused on the safety and, and, uh, of people. Um, and I just want to go back again one more time and talk a little bit about uh, being safe out in a boat, especially for fishing. Because, you know, you, you get that big one on the end of the line and everyone's really excited about getting in the boat. And next thing you know, everyone's hanging over and boom, somebody goes in, right? So can you talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the laws and regulations uh, in regards specifically to fishing or just in general to, uh, to recreational boating? Okay, there are no differences between whether you're on a boat to fish or just to, to recreate and what, what the laws are you have to follow. So we have one set of marine safety laws in the state. Um, and, and the big thing is you gotta have a life jacket on board for everybody, depending on the size of the boat it is, depends on what type of life jacket that may be. Personal flotation device, that's a legal term, but everybody calls them life jackets, so that's typically what we do. Um, make sure you have one on board for everybody, and I suggest wearing them. As I, I mentioned earlier, that there's lots of different life jacket styles out there now, so you can find one that's comfortable, and half the time you forget it's even on. Um, I like to tell people, again, with, with the hunting, let people know where you're going to be, so if you're not back when you're supposed to be, that somebody knows where you were and what you were planning on doing. Um, know the body of water you're on. Uh, a lot of times people put onto a great big new lake or river and just take off and go crazy, and after a while they don't remember where they are. or um, they don't know where the submerged uh, obstructions are. So pay attention to that. And again, I always tell people don't, don't drink and use drugs when you're out doing that kind of thing. Because even though it's legal on a boat to have open intox and, and for people to be drinking, I don't recommend it because it does impair your judgment. And um, I've seen some bad sunburn cases <laughs> with people, you know, that they're drinking all day on the boat and not paying attention. They come back and then they end up having to go to the hospital. So sun protection is another thing a lot of people forget about. And it's always key to take a boater safety class, right? Yeah, boater safety, I recommend that you know, everybody takes that. There's certain ages that it's required, but uh, and anybody can benefit from a boater safety class, definitely. And if you want to find out where a boater safety class is being given, where can they uh, find that information? Out? If you're computer savvy, you can just check online. And uh, there's a lot of online boating classes now, several that the state of Michigan recognizes. And, uh, or you can just call one of our offices or the report on poaching line and we'll direct you to to somebody to get you the answer. Okay, great, Captain Captain Robson. You know, one of the uh, one of the big topics uh, of the day, um, especially when it comes to um, our Great Lakes, is invasive species. And um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, invasive species in our waters? What are some of the invasive species uh, that we're that we're seeing? And um, you know, what should we be on the, on the lookout for, and is there a way to report invasive species? Sure. There's, there's a lot of invasive species out there now, and just in the water, uh, the big one that everybody's talking about is Asian carp, mm -hmm. uh, you know, big-headed carp and such, and they're not in the Great Lakes right now, and we hope they don't end up here, but uh, they're in the Mississippi River, you know, they're pretty close. We get a lot of uh, reports of people thinking they have that type of fish, and they call our report out poaching line, and we go out and it ends up being some other type of fish, usually a dogfish or bowfin or something. Um, Zebra mussels, uh, some other kind of mussels that you know are similar to zebra mussels, gobies and uh, uh, ruffies and uh, 
and that's just the things that like the fish and, and animals. There's also the plants. You know, that's what a lot of inland lakes get. You know, is plants that choke out the lake and kill the lake. Um, depending on what type of invasive species you're you're talking about or you think you may have, um, if you can go on our website. It, it'll give you numbers to call. If it's a plant, call this, this number and talk to these people. If it's a fish, call these people. If it's an animal, call these people. Uh, Department of Ag is involved in some on-land species. Um, one I was just reading about recently is the giant hogweed that uh, is from China and the leaves are huge. And, and depending on your uh, allergic reaction to it, it can cause blindness and permanent scarring in a wow. person. So um, if you think you come across some of the stuff, maybe it might not be best to pick it and take it with you, but take pictures and try to identify it and, and definitely get on our website or call our offices. Yeah, that's a huge impact on, on, uh, on uh, our state and um, a potential huge in economic impact, uh, especially uh, if the Asian carp gets in there. Like, and I know that uh, we're working on that not only at the state level, but also at the federal level as well. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that uh, uh, we keep those invasive species out. So I can tell you as a legislature, we're conscious about that all the time. Um, so we talked about the five most important things uh, you can do to have a safe and fun hunting trip. But what about the five? And I know we kind of covered this already, but if you could reiterate a little bit, uh, give me five things that uh, someone can do to make sure that their fishing trip is safe and enjoyable. And that's going to depend on whether you're on a boat or on the shore. So that's kind of a tough one to answer. I think I covered some of that on the boat. You know, have a life jacket, know where you're going, uh, let somebody know where you are. Um, but if you're going to do shore fishing, again, um, Know, know the plants in the area, and if you come across something that maybe you don't recognize or looks like a th uh, leaves a three, let it be. You know, don't go rolling around in the poison ivy patch. That can ruin a fishing trip. Um, I've assisted many fishermen with removing hooks from their hands. You know, be careful yeah. with that stuff. Some of that's yeah. sharp and as dangerous. Uh, know what you're doing, you know, and if you're in a group of people, don't be casting like a crazy person, you know, take yeah. your time and, 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 and slow down and enjoy the process. And I, I used to have a lot of people that I'd come up to and, and complain that they didn't have a fish. And I'd tell them, you know, if you catch a fish, it's a bonus. You're fishing. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like golfing. If you get a good score, it's a bonus. Yeah. You're there, you know, you got to be there for the right reasons. Um, and again, take plenty of food and water and let somebody know where you're going to be. In this day and age with telephones, I recommend everybody take a cell phone with them and, and, and know where they're at. A lot of people end up not knowing where they're at, so they call for help. Um, they end up having to call 911 so we can, you know, see where they are on a GPS. But know where you're at and what you're doing. Yeah, I uh, I have to tell you, I had a rather enjoyable uh, fishing trip uh, for walleye in Lake Erie one time. Uh, I ended the trip in the emergency room, taking my buddy in to get a hook taken out of his thumb. <laughs> so it, was, it had to be surgically removed. It was in uh, so deep. So absolutely, you need to uh, be aware and be safe of your own equipment, mm -hmm. let alone anything else. Um, so, uh, Captain Robson, we talked about hunting, we talked about fishing, uh, but I know that some of the people watching out there uh, um, are in, in involved in trapping as a sport. Um, can you touch a little bit about uh, trapping and some of the rules and regulations? Sure. Sure. Trapping uh, is getting uh, to be a bigger sport in Michigan. A lot more people getting involved in it. A lot of the rules are, are being changed yearly to allow uh, more people into it and more opportunities. Um, the big thing with trapping is, is the one big rule to tell everybody is make sure your name and address is on your trap. No matter what kind of trap it is, your name and address has to be on it or your driver's license number. So that if somebody comes across it or we come across it, we can identify whose it is. But trapping has gotten, uh, I guess, so complex would be a way to say it in the last few years on, on what type of trap you can use on private property, what type of trap you can use on public property, what size of trap you can use for this, what size you can use for that, where you are in the state. And, and how often you have to check that trap. Is it every 24 hours? Is it every 48 hours? So uh, get a digest, look at the digest, know what you're going for. Um, you know, if you're trapping bobcat, you got lots of different units, beaver are in different units, otter in different units, know where you're at. Uh, look at the digest. When any, anybody asks me a trapping question now, I say, let's pull the digest out and see what it says because they're continually changing. You know, look at the digest every year. Don't just read it once in your life and think you're good because it changes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so do the uh, limits on some of the animals you can take, you know, and a lot of the animals now require the, the tags, just like a deer tag, you know, your otter and your bobcat require tags. Um, so read the digest and, and, and know these things or call us and we'll try to walk you through it. And is there a season for any particular animal when it comes to trapping? Yeah, there's seasons for almost everything. Just like uh, hunting, there are a few things you can trap year round, such as the possum and the, and the porcupine and weasel. But uh, 
most everything is in the fall, starts in October. There's certain time frames where you can't be so close to water because we don't want traps in the water for water species yet, you know, dry land trapping. But uh, October is typically the month that most trapping starts. And um, so we talked about hunting, we've talked about fishing, uh, but uh, there's more to the DNR than just hunting and fishing. So what are some of your other responsibilities uh, um, for protecting uh, Michigan's natural resources? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the DNR is made up of many different divisions, and, and the and conservation officers are the enforcement branch for those divisions. Some of the divisions in, in, are in the news lately are, are minerals division and mining. Um, you know, we got a lot of mining going on up in the UP now and proposed mining and mining uh, land transfers. Forestry is a huge industry in the state of Michigan. I think it's a $16 billion industry in Michigan, if I read my uh, stats right on that, um, especially in northern Michigan. And that's on the state side. You also got federal forestry. You know, federal, federal land is big in Michigan, too. Um, obviously wildlife, fisheries, uh, parks and recreation division, you know, camping is big in Michigan. Um, the governor in his last few budgets have proposed general fund money for conservation officers because so many people come into Michigan for non-hunting and fishing activities, uh, whether it be sightseeing, uh, uh, camping, uh, tours around the Great Lakes for the color tours and such, and they want to have a safe and enjoyable triple in Michigan. And so we want to make sure the state is enjoyable so they can come in here and it isn't just hunting and fishing. But hunting and fishing dollars are typically what drive the department. And, and that leads me into my, my next question is the economy of uh, Michigan's natural resources. So when you, when you look at the big picture, not just hunting and fishing, but uh, the tourism altogether, can you give us a, a rough idea how much all that generates in, in the state of Michigan economically? Yeah, altogether, I don't have a real good answer, but hunting and fishing, I think, brings in about $6 billion. $6 billion, wow. $6 billion. And forestry, like I said, $16 yeah. billion. Uh, boating, I believe it's about around another $4 billion. Um, and, and, I, and I don't even recall what uh, parks and recreation, you know, the camping sure. brings in. But yeah, it's tremendous. Uh, Michigan is a, is a tourist destination state for outdoor activities, and it's a beautiful place to come and visit. Yeah, beautiful place to live too. It's, it's, it's a great place to live. I, <laughs> I love it. But um, so and and then so the money that's collected, and we'll just focus specifically on the hunting and fishing license. Okay. The money that's collected on hunting and fishing license, where does that money go? That money goes back into uh, managing the resources. Um, whether it be the enforcement, uh, fish yeah. stocking, wildlife management, habitat improvement, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. So it goes back into the programs. Yeah, it just doesn't take care of itself, right? No, it's, no, it's, right. it's managed and properly managed. Correct. And there's a cost to properly managing uh, our, our state. So, And last but not least, uh, boating is, uh, I think you just mentioned it, We're, uh, uh, boating brings in a, a large amount of uh, uh, dollars. Is, is Michigan still number one in the country in regards to the number of boat owners? Boat registration. Boat registrations. Was the, uh, I know for years we were number one on that. I haven't checked it recently, but I believe we still are because um, there, there are a lot of boat owners and a lot of boat registrations in the state of Michigan. And if I remember right, Florida was, was number two, and you know they have a huge coastline too. Yeah. But well, well, I can tell you from uh, being uh, uh, from a uh, county that's located on Lake St. Clair, I think uh, on some Saturdays, every boat in the state of Michigan is on Lake St. Clair. So, uh, Captain Tim Robinson, I cannot thank you. Robson, thank I you. cannot thank you so much for, uh, I can't thank you enough for coming uh, onto our show today and telling us about the DNR. Uh, it was a great pleasure having you here, so thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. I hope I can come back. Thank you for watching this episode of the State of Your State. I'd like to thank my guest, DNR Conservation Officer, Captain Tim Robson, for joining me today. And I'd like to thank all of you for watching. I look forward to another discussion soon about a topic that affects the quality of your life here in our community and throughout the state. I encourage you to contact me if you have any questions or concerns, or if I can be of any help. You can contact me toll free at 1-855-926-3925 or email me at henryannas, all one word, at house.mi.gov or through my website at yannas.housedems, again all one word, it, con it continues to be an honor to serve as your voice in Lansing, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Until then, goodbye.